And this morning, we all come to the cross. For some, it is a long journey. And for others, they need only look around their lives and see themselves at the foot of the cross or even up on the cross. This morning, we tell God's story that is our story. We, we tell it on land that is the traditional home of many indigenous peoples, including the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississaugas of Scugog. Good Friday has a layered meaning when we consider our past relationships with our indigenous siblings and our desire to be reconciled, to live justly, respectfully, lovingly. And we come to the cross with the LGBTQ plus community, those who identify in binary and non-binary terms of reference, those who expand our understanding of gender and visual assumptions about people, the cross has a special resonance when we consider the pain, the lost witness, the injustice that has marginalized those that God loves and for whom Christ comes to the cross. We are all called to the cross together, each of us bringing our experience, looking for our own answers, and being not just witnesses to but participants in this story and in God's love. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And so guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms, and he praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. O oh, radiant light, of flame divine as shines the light of morning's dawn come bless the embers of the earth sparks flung from our eternal birth O word of God the source of life you rouse us from the night of fears to open souls and minds and ears and hear the music of the spheres. You are the fire that birthed all things, the force that spins the galaxies. 
are the flame within all flames, the hidden power that knows no name. From you all things that are were sent, and into you does all extend. Peel back the bark of any tree, lift up a stone, they blaze with thee. Is it that we come to meet here? Here at the cross. A cross that is shrouded. A cross that is a symbol of betrayal and injustice and hurt. How is it? that we have ended up here together. Together, let us hear the story. Let us open our hearts and our minds. Let us recognize our story in God's story. Let us Come to the cross together, that we might know that we are not alone. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and, and keep awake. And then going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. He came and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said, Are you still sleeping and still taking your rest? Enough! Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately while he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one that I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. Lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to Jesus at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. And then they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And all of them deserted him and fled.
Then they took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy the temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. And, and then the high priest stood up before them, and he asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah? the Son of the Blessed One. And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You've heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And all of them condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying, Prophesy! The guards took him over, and they beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But Peter denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you're talking about. And then he went out into the forecourt, and then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you're one of them, for you're a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know this man that you're talking about. And at that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. And then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and he wept.
As soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. And then the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. And now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. And so he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have them release Barabbas for them instead. And Pilate spoke to them again, Then what do you wish me to do with that man you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! And so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clephas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, 
here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. And after this, when Jesus knew that all was finished, he said in order to fulfill the scriptures, I am thirsty. And a jar full of sour wine was standing there. And so they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and they held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let us pray. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, our broken hearts, our hurting hearts, our dreaming hearts, our questioning hearts, our beating hearts, our faint hearts, may all of the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your eyes. May they, may they bring us together into your story. And God, may I never lightly presume to preach your word, to tell your story, because in your word is abundant life. In your story is our story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's Good Friday. And for some of us, it's the first time we've been to a Good Friday service. Because it's the kind of service that many people stay away from. Who wants to be sad? Who wants to struggle? Who wants to hear that horrible story? Can't we just jump to, to Easter and, and be okay? After all, things are tough enough. And so we're not always sure about Good Friday, and I think a lot of us just don't go to a Good Friday service. But because this one is virtual, this one is online, and, and you can turn it off anytime you want or fast forward through it, maybe this is a safe time to investigate a Good Friday service. A safe time knowing that Nobody's looking at you, nobody's judging you, deciding whether you're solemn enough. So Good Friday, we've heard the story. You might even be able to hear the rain falling right now. All of this combines it combines to give us an image, and, and if we try, I think we can see Jesus on the cross, back there in our imagination, in our mind. Jesus on the cross, alone. There are voices. Weeping can be heard, but it's, it's far away. And the sky is, is dark. And hope seems a faint memory. And I recognize this place. It's where and how I live right now. I live separated and silent and, and hurting. And, and I can hear people, but they're far away. It almost makes it worse. I live in a world of isolation right now. There is a virus that is, is killing people. People that I know and love. People that I might love if I ever met them. But someone loves them. Someone is crying just for them today. 
And I can't even distract myself with a baseball game or, or a walk in the park. I, I simply have to sit and take it all in. It's almost like I'm nailed to the spot. It's called Good Friday. We dare to call it good. Jesus on the cross, why? Why would we call that good? Well, for some, Jesus on the cross becomes good because, well, because in a sense it, it, it gets us away from our pain, right? It takes the pain of our lives, the pain of the world, and puts it on Jesus takes it up off our shoulders and puts it up on the cross with Jesus. Our sins are forgiven. An end to pain is promised. After centuries, even millennia of making sacrifices to God, that was the custom. You know, the best that we had to offer, the youngest, most pure, most perfect dove or calf, making those offerings so that God might be merciful and kind to us. In this moment, we recognize God making a sacrifice to us. Jesus, the one so close, so precious, that we would call him the Son of God. That one. That Son of God is sacrificed to us by God as a sign, as, as a promise of love and devotion in the same way that our sacrifices were meant to be a promise of love and devotion. The Lamb of God sacrificed as we have sacrificed so many lambs before. When I feel distant, when I feel separated from a seemingly unfeeling God, this story, this Jesus on the cross, this trading of sacrifices, it, it makes sense. The cross is a sign of God reaching out to humanity, reaching out to me. God offers a sacrifice that I might know that I matter. We all matter to God, and God seeks a relationship. It's not just us making sacrifices, not just us seeking relationship, but God is doing that as well. That's good, I suppose. And for some people, it, it's, it's hard to imagine that we are loved by God. I mean, really loved and valued and treasured, right? Even though we are nasty and brutish, even though we rarely live up to our potential, we frequently break our promises, we distance ourselves from God, we sin knowing full well what we're doing. But somehow, God continues to love us. And in this world in which we live, I mean, we know that you can't get something for nothing. That's not how the world works. So surely, so surely God's love has been paid for, right? Because we can't get something for nothing. There must be some kind of insurance payment that, that pays for the damages of our sin. And so we can imagine that Jesus comes to the cross in our stead. He's there because we, we can't be. And, and he takes our sins and he embraces the punishment that we deserve. He's innocent on the cross, unjustly accused. But we're, we're not innocent. And, and our guilt is, is obvious. His death on the cross is really our deserved punishment, our deserved death, payment for our sins. 
And so somehow, I guess, the balance of love is maintained by this sacrifice. And, and some days, that makes sense to me, too. Those days when I feel dirty and worthless and ashamed, on those days, it, it's a relief to know that somebody else is picking up the bill. Somebody has paid my debt. That's good, I suppose. For some, the cross is a sign of all the evil that the world can do. Right? It, it's the end. The cross is the end of a road that moves through betrayal and mocking and humiliation and lies and deceit and false accusations, indignity and torture, a death penalty rendered for petty, petty crimes. And all this evil that we know exists in the world, all of this evil that we have experienced ourselves, is not enough to silence God. It's not enough to destroy love. The most that the world has to throw at God is not enough to win. We know that because, because Jesus forgives even from the cross. And God's last word is still to come. And we know, we know in our bones, we know that that last word is life, not death. In the face of injustice, when I am tempted to despair, in the face of great injustice, this is comforting. It's comforting to know that darkness will not, that darkness cannot overcome the light. It is a comfort to know that God will have the last word. And that's good. But today, right now, for me, it's different. I don't know whether it's the isolation or the weather or what it is, but somehow I mean redeemed and ransomed and replaced, these are all good. But not enough for me, not today. Today, today I recognize God's presence in Jesus up on that cross. God's presence is the, is the one who is at one with God, innocent and undeserving of even contempt, never mind death. I recognize God's presence in the one who is the face of poverty, the one who is the face of the unjustly accused, the one who is dying, the one who asks for help and instead is shot dead. The one who is in pain. You know, reading any kind of Holy Scripture from any tradition, it's always been clear that God has something important to say to the poor. God has something to say to those who are suffering. God has something to say to the marginalized. God has something to say to victims. But on this cross, on this cross today, I recognize that even more, God is being more than saying. God is right up there on the cross. God is right here. God is right there with the poor and the unjustly accused. God is with us in our dying. God is present in our pain. God does not flee the victims of injustice or assault, violence or indifference. God is present, knowing and experiencing these things as we do. God doesn't just have something to say. God has a way of being present. And in that, all of the distance between God and humanity, all the distance between us is gone. And, 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 and sin, the separation between me and God, is overcome. 
It is forgiven, in a sense, on that cross because we are together one. There is no distance between us in my suffering, in God's suffering. We are together in the suffering of the world, the suffering of Jesus. We are one together. I might be distant from those who do not understand, right? Those who have not shared my burden, those who don't know my struggle. But I am not distant from God, who through Jesus and on this cross knows my burden, engages in my struggle. In that presence, I know that I'm not alone ever. God loves me. And that's good. That's very good. And I, and I need to be reminded, especially when I'm hurting, when I'm grieving, when I'm losing. I need to know this when I am in isolation, having done nothing wrong. And this is no simple thing, right? This is, this is no simple, I love you, signed at the bottom of a psalm. This isn't a text, BTW, love you. This is real love. And real love is hard. Love is hard, really hard. It's not like the romance movies that some of us are binging these days. It's not like the feel-good memes that light up our media feeds. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. Real love hurts. Anyone who has stayed up caring for a crying child knows this. Anyone who has ever cared for someone who will never be exactly like the others knows this. Anyone who has sat with a grandparent or a parent in the last days, the last hours of life knows this. Anyone who has buried someone before their time knows this. Anyone who has been there when a loved one got the diagnosis knows this. Anyone who has loved an addict, anyone who has seen a relationship end, anyone who has fed a hungry stranger or, or welcomed a refugee only to have their eyes and hearts open to the thousands more who are still hungry and still fleeing, knows that love hurts. Real love is hard. But as hard as it is, God does it. Through Jesus on that cross and everything that led up to that cross, God lives a love that is hard and shows us that we're not alone when loving is the hardest thing. God is present. We are not alone. And love is worth it. God shows us that. And you know it. I know it. Even when it hurts, you and I know deep in our bones that love is worth it. Love survives everything, even death. Love changes the world. We know from experience that love changes the lover as well as the loved which means that this cross, this cross changes both us and God. It brings us together in our common experience of humanity, hurting and loving. And that is good. That is very, very good to know that we're not alone even when the world seems dark, even when we feel isolated and afraid and extinguished, even when the story tells us that Jesus is dead, we know the important truth, and that's that we are not alone. You are not alone. And Good Friday is both the promise and the proof.
Thanks be to God. Let us pray. A loving God, we may not know how to find the happiness in Good Friday, because perhaps there is no happiness, but let us find the love. Let us find the truth. And that we are not alone. And that you are with us, even unto death and beyond. Remind us always, God, that love matters. That you seek us out even as we seek you. And that we belong together. On the cross, in our homes, in joy, and in struggle. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.